puts like the underscores around something and then later on remove all the other. So it's all kinds of little tricks and it's all this old level bullshit. Because we never do it again. I mean, you don't want to do this unless you have to. I've done it. I've done it. I'm trying to get classical texts. And, the, and sometimes you, you have this one. This one is a transcription. It's Somebody couldn't figure out which one it was. They put two with the slash. And then there's a slash quick, which means it says it real fast. And then there's a place where there's a whole you know, question mark and a colon. And it helps with that. And then it's followed by another one, which meant that it was a plain line. It's errors. So machines or humans will make errors. But the point is, again, we're trying to come up with the cast, which is to fill the vowel for it. And there's a couple little errors that need to attempt to fix the Okay, let us get started, folks. Let us get started. Any questions before we start? Any questions of general interest? Trying to keep up with Piazza? Uh, yes. I'm sorry? That's me. Yes. Totally confused about perplexity. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no question. Okay. I'm trying to keep up with Piazza, office hours. I hope we're going well. Um, getting another assignment, which I've already written, so you're going to get it Wednesday night. I'm going to say this more than once. It's a ton harder than the first one. Those are just getting going. You know, people joining late, getting up to speed on Python. Start early. Start early. Some, this is like last year. Sorry, some percentage of you are going to freak out on Tuesday night and realize you can't do it in one night. No, you're not going to freak out. You're going to do it early, right? No, no, the next one. You're going to do it right away, right? You're going to get right on that Friday night. You're not going to go party. You're going to sit at home and work right? no, don't. <laughs> Party and then work on the party, okay? Um, some smaller percentage will ask for extensions, and I will say no. Sorry. Okay, you've got to start over. The rest of the assignments are going to be very complex. You're going to have to spend time. You're going to have to write a model. And then you're going to test it under various circumstances. You've got to write the model early so you have time to test it. And run. Now, these aren't ones that are going to run forever. right? But later on, you're going to have ones that are going to run for a really long time. We're going to get on to the SEC, or you're going to run it on your own machine. I tend to just run things on my own machine. Overnight, um, I was. I don't know if this is possible. It doesn't seem possible, but our electric bill and house went up by a hundred dollars in one month. Is that possible? To run in my machine constantly? Yeah. I figured it was only 100, 200 watts, but I turned the screen off. But still, yeah. Uh, creating these large language models at Google it takes an immense amount of energy, right? So it's not just for free. Anyway. Okay, let's get going. No question? Yeah, question. Okay, question is, are you, did you ask that? And I, I meant to give you an answer. Um, G, GPUs are not the same thing as having multiple cores in your machine. Multiple cores means separate CPUs and you can multi-thread. You can run one task and you can run another task. And you can run this task and then you can do your email. And then you, you could run something in the background while you're doing other things, right? But a GPU will take a matrix and it has special operations and it will, in parallel on the one data structure, it will say process every row in parallel. You can't do that on your machine unless you have a GPU. It's a special processor that works on matrices. And there's, there's other things as well. 
So you, you, you have something that has, I have 10 cores. I bought, I bought extra cores, and they came it with help me, but doesn't. I never run 10 programs at once. We can talk some more. Okay. So uh, Colab, so far we don't need that. GPUs are not going to help you for these assignments right now. It's when we start doing machine learning neural networks, and we have matrices and batches, and it'll speed things up there. It's a finer grain kind of parallelism than <coughs> multiple cores. OK. So yeah, there's me. There's me looking at a book, confused as always. Uh, yeah, I guess that was right after I got my hair cut. So. Um, let's just review. Uh, generative models are a really cool thing you can do with language models, particularly in the case of n-grams. We're also going to we're also going to do this for uh, sequence models. We're going to do it with recurrent networks, and I just think they're a lot. I just think they're a lot of fun. Uh, they're just really fun to play with. Uh, it's state of the art. It's generating language, just like ChatGPT. Maybe not as well. But it's the same process. So let's just review. Uh, but language models. Uh, are not just for generating, they're also for doing anything else you want to do in NLP, for doing sentiment, for having a chat box, and so um, But for this first, I want to dig into this a little bit, because <clears throat> um, what we're going to do is uh, build this the next time, build one of these the next time, and you'll have fun with it. My kind of fun. Your kind of fun, too. Right? Um, you pre-process your corpus into sentences, you don't have to do this, but I'm going to do it, and it makes it a little easier. You consider the beginning of the word and the ending of the word to be a token, a word, right? And then you, you don't have to think about beginnings and endings. You calculate the probability distribution for all k grams. Suppose we're, sorry, we're building an n-gram language model for some n. Typically, n is 2. That's sort of the least you would bother with. Four, Five, it's getting up there. You need a lot of data if you're going to have pentagrams, right? So we're going to try it from two to four in the, in the brown corpus. So you go through and for all of the n, n, n grams, or k, k grams for k, you know, two to n, say two, three, four, you, have to, you need all of them, all, all three of those. I'll show you why in a minute. Well, right here. Um, you want to generate the first word. You generate one word at a time. And you use as much less context as you have. When you have a uh, tessagram, I think they call it quadrogram, you know, when you have four, three of them are less context and one's the new word. When you have a bigram, one word of context and the next word, and so forth, right? So you'll, you'll, you'll sample from the distribution of bigrams. I'm going to show you how you do this in a second. And you generate, you find a bigram, S, with some word that's reasonably likely. Here's your word, generate. Now you have one word. Now you have two words of context. So now look at the trigram. And it begins like this. S, the word you just got, with another word. Pick one that's likely. It doesn't have to be the absolute most likely, if you always remember. If you always pick the most likely one, you're going to generate one sentence, not this one, right? So you want to generate words according to the distribution, how likely they are in the corpus. Um, then you get the second word, and then you just keep doing that. Now, until you get your full context. So if you're doing uh, quadrograms, as soon as you get to three words, you know, sentence marker, word, word, now you have enough context to generate the fourth word, and then you slide it forward. Now you can use the full, you use as much context as you can, right? That's the idea. So now you've got, you've got uh, four words. Now the sentence marker is the first one. Then you have three word, actual words that are interesting. Those are the context, generate the fourth one, and you keep going. It's a very simple idea. <clears throat> and then you just keep doing that until you get to the end of sentence marker. And you're done. You've generated a sentence. Now, for the rest of this, 
class, we're going to think about how to some of the issues there. And I'm going to focus for the moment on generative models. But remember, they're not the only way that we use models. Don't think that this is the only purpose of a model to generate sentences. You might be using it to do classification. Uh, you might be using it for lots of other things. So um, here's, here's an exciting text. Boy, did I try. I tried uh, a bunch of Dr. Zeus. I tried uh, one fish, red fish, blue, blue, whatever. I tried uh, cat and a hat. None of them seemed to work. So I just made up something completely silly. Uh, John likes to watch. It's based on the exciting text we had last time. John likes to watch movies. Mary likes to play cards. John likes to play cards too, but Mary likes to play cards more than John. Okay, we're getting to know John and Mary. We process this three sentences, we process them into sentence with boundary markers. You put the S at the beginning, slap backslash S at the end. There are our sentence markers. Okay. This is when when we do our models, we're going to use the brown corpus. You already given the sentence. Okay. We're going to think about whether we want to do some cleaning up and get rid of the punctuation. Maybe not. Let's think about it. Um, at least what I do is I eliminate the period at the end of the sentence because it's redundant. But you might want to include punctuation because maybe that's part of an interesting sentence. Right? But you don't need the period at the end. And in the Brown Dictionary, they have the period at the end. Um, now, let's say we're doing biograms. And then that's all we need, right? <laughs> Two to whatever, but it's just bigrams. So we calculate all possible bigrams. Now here are the raw percentages. What I did was I just created all sequences of two, and I counted how many times they showed up. That's something familiar that you're doing in the last problem in the homework. You're counting how many times the words show up, right? Adding to a default dictionary, and what you get is a that case, a bag of words. This is a bag of bigrams. Ideal. But we're normal instead of counts, we're normalizing it to be probabilities, but it's the same exact thing. Vectors are going to be what we're going to encode language in almost always. So they're all interrelated. So here's John starts of all the bigrams, and there are 28 bigrams, and so you can see these counts here, which aren't very helpful. Uh, start of sentence John occurs in 2 out of 28. Okay? You can see John, beginning of a sentence, John, beginning of a sentence, that's there. John likes. John likes. John likes. Occurs twice. Right? Out of 28 bigrams. Okay. So notice that many of them only occur once. And then we have one that occurs four times, likes to, likes to, likes to, likes to, likes to. But there's a lot of information that's very, it's very narrow. I mean, it, there's only one of them. <laughs> and what we're going to deal with later is what happens when it drops to zero. What do you do? Um, but so, not, not a terribly interesting data set, but uh, at least it's easy enough I can put it on the slide. So, <clears throat> here's what we're going to do. We are now going to generate the next word following the distribution of that diagram that we completed. So sample from the distribution of diagrams with first token S to get the first word. Let's see how that would work. <coughs> so the, and I'm not going to put these conditional probabilities up all semester, but let's relate it to what we did last time. The probability of start John, given that the last token was start, now a little subtlety, I should have put the dots there. It's not really the unigram probability. It's the probability, well, I guess for, for the start, of start symbol, that's true. <laughs> But it's, you know, of the bigrams that start with S, how many of them are John and how many of them are something else? Well, there's only John likes, John likes twice, Mary likes once. So of the three possibilities, John is two of them. So the probability 
that John follows the start symbol is two-thirds, right? It's a conditional probability. You have to normalize it to the setting where you've seen the start symbol, and is it Mary or John that goes next? It can't be anything else according to our data. So it's conditional probability. You're calculating the probability that S starts some bigram is John likes, Mary likes, John likes. There's three of them out of 28. And the two of them are John, and one of them is Mary. So you can see, you get it. You get it. Of the ones that could possibly apply to the left context, choose among those that, where there's a bigram, a continuation according to the probability. Don't just choose the best one. You only get one answer. So there's uh, this choice function, which you might have seen from NumPy random. And if you give it, this may be how you do it. It may be something else, but this is the idea. Um, you choose John or Mary, and you put the probabilities here. Two thirds for John, one third for Mary. If you run this multiple times over and over and over and over and over, John will occur twice as much as Mary, which is what you would expect from the sentence. So you're simulating what happens as you read through the sentence from left to right. Now, suppose our random sample gives us John as two thirds. It doesn't have to, but two thirds of the time it's going to give you John. And you just continue. And in this case, we don't have to. We don't have anything lengthening. We just looked at the last symbol. So we got John. Okay. And then if we look at John, John likes is two of them. John end of sentence, because he occurred at the end of the sentence. That's possible, because we're only looking at little windows, remember? We can't tell that that John is before a whole bunch of other stuff. It's just you're looking at these windows of two words. So as far as this model, which is very localized, um, John can be followed by likes two-thirds of the time, and followed by the end of the sentence one-third of the time. And so here are the probabilities. Suppose you flip the die, or whatever, and let's say it's just likes. Okay, now we have John likes. Now here I've underlined the context you're going to use to select the next word. Right? So then you have likes. Well, this one's easy. Uh, wait a minute. Is that true? Yeah, likes is yeah, likes is just one. So likes occurs four times. There's nothing else that. And there's no other bigram that starts likes. Likes is always followed by two in the dip. Likes two, likes two, likes two, likes two. Likes two goes together. There's no other possibility. <laughs> right? So according to your model of the language, you have to choose it. So the probability of likes two is one. OK, so you choose two, you force two. John likes two, OK, to play, to watch. Well, you go through and you see, well, there's four of them that start with two. One, see, to watch, to play, to play, to play. Three of them are play, one of them is watch, three fourths possibility. Let's say again we roll the die and uh, we, get, we get watch. Now we have, wait, what happened? Oh, play, I'm sorry, <laughs> I put it here. We get play, three fourths. Okay. Doesn't have to, right? Probability. Uh, we get play. John likes to play. Okay, now play, play cards. It's only one play cards. They don't play movies. You can play a movie, push the button. That's not what we do. Play cards? Has to be. Okay, now we have cards. Now, uh, cards followed by something else. Cards more. Cards end of string. Cards two. So there's a one third possibility for each one of these. You choose one of them. Let's say it's the end of sentence marker. You're done. John likes to play cards. And that's a prefix of one of them. But it didn't get chosen just because it was the first five sentences. It went through, and because of the random choices, it chose that sentence. Okay. Now, let's think of this. Remember Markov, Mr. Markov, um, counting the characters in Eugene Odingen's novel. Um, You can, a Markov chain is something which makes transitions between different states 
based on some finite number of elements of the past. And that's what we're doing here. And this is using one state, the names here, the words are the states. And this uses one state, give me one second. This uses one state of history. Remember, our Markov chain uses a finite number of states in the back. It goes through some state transitions and it looks at some finite number, a fixed number, before it decides. And that's what we're doing. Yeah. Good question. Um, so, right now we're not worried about this. <laughs> we're going to build up with the messy problems. Don't worry, we'll get there. Simplistic. Um, what you're doing then, this is a graph, the cycles, so it can create an infinite number of sentences, right? Uh, you start here, you roll the die, whatever. Uh, you choose John likes to play cards, and then you go here. That's where we went. But you could have gone, John likes to play cards too, but Mary likes to play cards. Now there's a sentence that wasn't in it. Right? This can generate an infinite number of sentences. It can generate the three we have, but it can generate lots of other sentences too. It can generate John. Just John, right? <laughs> and there's some of those in our current, right, in the script. Right? Ha! You know, pirates. Are, that's enough for a pirate. Um, so, another way to think of this, though, but notice that it has loops. So it has an infinite number of sentences. Another way to think about this is to expand it out to a tree, an infinite tree. And then we are keeping track of how long the sentences are. So in the first step, we're here. Then we choose one of these possibilities. Then we choose one of these possibilities. Then we have to choose this. Remember, this is keeping track of the history. The, entire, the actual sentence is being traced as a path through this <coughs> infinite tree. And so then we're choosing one of these play or watch, then we're choosing movies, cards, movies, then we're choosing the end of sentence, two more end of sentence, and so forth. And we keep going infinitely in this direction. And a sentence that we generate is a path which ends in the end of sentence mark. We'll come back to this. I don't know if I'm going to get it by the end of the... We'll do it next time. But that is what you're doing. And the question is, looking ahead a bit, if I'm trying to generate a good sentence that's likely, that has high probability, how do I search for it? How do I, how do I avoid sentences which are less likely? Think about it. We're going to come back to that. That's what you're doing when you generate the generative model. You're trying to find sentences in here that are good sentences, that are likely. And they may satisfy some other criterion like they answer the question that was posed in the chat. <laughs> They're on a subject that we could use for. They're a summary of something, right? Now, let's leave aside generative models for the moment. We're going to refer to them, but I want to keep emphasizing that generative models are not the only thing you're going to do with models. Every task in natural language processing is based on a model. And right now we're using n-grams, and they are kind of slick for, for doing generative models, and that's sort of fun, and we're going to do that in the next assignment. Did I, did I tell you it was really hard and start early? That sounds like something I would say. Yeah. Um, just check. Um, so remember what language models do. They assign a probability to a sequence of tokens. Now, they're not complete sentences until you get to the end of a sentence. Of course, we want complete sentences. But along the way, we're generating them left to right. It's not arbitrary. It's kind of intuitive, at least in English. Maybe not in Hebrew or Chinese or Japanese. Uh, but um, 
you're going left to right. You could have gone right to left. I guess you could have started in the middle and gone, you know, there's various ways to generate a sequence. We're going left to right. So keep that in mind. The best language models now do more than that. Now, a model is a probability distribution. It has a domain and it assigns objects in the domain to a probability. The domain is sentences or sequences of words, okay? Um, some language models, like the model, a character model, say it has 26 letters. No, plus a blank, 27. Maybe some punctuation. 30, 30 some letters. It's finite. You can assign probabilities to it. So if you want to generate sentences, character for character, you might want to follow this distribution, right? We'll get to that. We're going to do those later on, character level models. But in our case, the domain is sentences, or sequences of letters, se sequences of words. Um, it has an infinite range. <laughs> There's potentially an <coughs> infinite number of sentences you can generate in the language. Um, and yes, although to get an infinite language you have to start generating unbounded sentences and sentences that are a million words long don't, aren't very natural. But the point is that we characterize it as infinite because that's the best way to characterize it. Yeah, I know there are practical things. There's only a finite number of atoms in the universe too. But we don't think that when we think about the universe. But it sort of is infinite. Now a data set is a finite, finite, finite sample of this infinite set. It's a sampling problem. It's a discrete probability distribution over an infinite domain. But you only have a finite number of sample points where the probability is non-zero. In other words, what we are doing is we have all possible sentences in the language, which for our purposes is infinite. And we are selecting a finite number, n sentences, say, as our sample. As, and the, those are the sentences in our corpus. So these could be the sentences in the brown corpus. Okay? And now we have a classical sampling problem. How well does this finite sample characterize the infinite set? Now, in statistics, one of the first things you can learn about is you know, the sampling theorem that uh, if you choose randomly, if you have 300, whatever, hundreds of millions of people, well, not everybody votes, right? some millions of people who vote, and if you choose completely randomly, you can choose a small number of them, and with a certain confidence level, you can know what percentage of people voted for each party. I could sample in this room. Uh, I could sample, uh, you know, if there's 200 of you, I could sample 30 of you and ask you privately, of course, whether you or not you have a tattoo. And after I do that with a certain confidence level, I will know how many people have tattoos without asking all of you. And that's what we're doing here, but it's, it's infinite. It's, it, there's nothing to do but sample. <laughs> right? All you have is bigger and bigger samples. So the quality of the sample depends, first of all, how big it is. We did talk about this a couple of classes ago. Um, you know, in this, in this article. Bigger is better. And the bigness of the data set is the most important thing. The bigness, the size of the data set is the most important thing. Not the quality of the model is secondary. Most important consideration is how many samples do you have? How big is your data? That's how they created you know, GPT-4. They just got a huge freaking amount of data. And then, how representative of the infinite language are the sample sentences? Right? If I'm saying, if I want to, uh, if I want to somehow uh, do some kind of natural language test that involves novels, classic novels from the 18th century, Jane Austen, you know, Thackeray, Dickens. I would say sampling news reports is probably not the right thing to do. 
because the sentences you get aren't going to be characteristic of novels. In other words, you have to match the sample to your task. If I'm trying to have a chat bot, I should sample from conversations, not novels, unless your chat bot wants to talk to you like a character from Dickens. What you want. If you're trying to imitate, if you're trying to uh, generate poetry, don't sample prose. It's not going to give you the right rhythm. You need to get that in. So how representative is this sample of the infinite, of the, of the genre, or whatever? And then, well, general language models, I checked. If you okay, they have to sample from a huge variety. So that's what we're going to do in the assignment. We're going to, we're going to, the brown corpus is divided, you can, if you look at it in detail, it's a whole bunch of things, right? It's news reports, it's novels, it's satirical novels, a bunch of things, right? So you have to think about this. how much and how representative. Now, for the rest of the class, we're going to talk about a couple issues, including the one that was just raised. Uh, if you want to build a good language model for whatever task, <coughs> two questions. At least two, the two right now. Once we built it, how do we assess how good it is? What's our measure of goodness? What's our measurement of quality? And one measurement is, wow, it's getting <coughs> What do we do about missing information? What do we do about missing information? Just to put a little, well, let's talk about extrinsic. So extrinsic, X outside. Extrinsic evaluation uses information that is outside the model. Okay? So suppose you have models A and B. Say one of them is a bigram model and one of them is a trigram. You're trying to figure out is it worth the extra storage and blah, 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 whatever for the trigram. There are just, they're about the same efficiency and storage. But you, you have these two models. Which one is better? Well, an extrinsic, which in the end is something you would have to do, um, put each model in its, its use, use case. Um, if it's a spelling checker, uh, put it in your iPhone. I, I think my iPhone has the beta version and they never updated it or something. Mm -hmm. Terrible. Um, speech recognizer. Put it in the UN and see if it starts a nuclear war. Does it translate or not? Not, not? Translation system. Have people look at it and say, is this a good translation? There are other measures for translation. It's something called the blue measure, B-L-E-U. And we'll talk about that later. So put it in real life, and now you have some other evaluation, which I can't say because it depends on the situation. So run the task. You get an accuracy for A and B. How many misspelled words, how many uh, are corrected, how many words are recognized, translated correctly. Um, if, you, uh, if you have a binary task, you can use a, well, you, you can use this uh, confusion matrix. It's four slots, you know, predicted, true, false, actual, true, false, you know, false positive, false negatives, false, all that. Or a confusion matrix that just lists all the, for a multi-classification problem, and it just tells you how many were labeled in which places, and you want things along the diagonal. We're going to do this later. Which are accurate. And there are ways, there are metrics which you can do. But... Okay, yeah, oh, yes, 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 yes. So you were saying that the more data, the better the model, that yep. makes sense. With the specific n-gram algorithm, how good does it get when trained on a huge amount of data? So for example, with the brown corpus, you showed, What's some, your you showed some sentences. How data. good? What do you want me to say? Like, for example, <laughs> one-third of the sentences probably made sense, right? Like how did you judge that? And end. No, I'm bugging you a little bit, but how do you judge? That's the whole point. How do you judge it? Looks good to me. I'll ask it's all my friends. It's hard to articulate the grammar and algorithm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mind, That's but, the whole point. You have to have some way of judging. But just like approximately, according to your definition, your opinion, I'm asking you, like, if you use this basic n-gram model on an absolutely like giant corpus, like that of Google that they provide from the web. 
it does a pretty that. good job in the, it, but think about what it's doing. I can't give an exact answer, but think about what it's doing. Yeah. It has a very local context. So it's not going to capture large range dependencies. It's going to look fine, except it'll wander and keep changing its mind and talk about different things like, like Donald Trump, you know, can't keep his mind, is the attention of a flea. And, you know, span of a, you know, it can't, it can't keep track of things that happened previous to the history. So that's one thing you're going to see. But it'll read okay, but it just doesn't keep track of things. Dimension, you know, it's got dimension. Um, so, lots of reasons why this is hard. Um, extrin extrinsic is hard. You deploy, it, you deploy it in real life, you measure it with some measurement. It's time consuming. The accuracy of the measurement is proportional to the length of time. It can take a very long time to gather information from a bunch of users. It may be difficult, you know, subject to the proper design of the experiment. Um, it just may be a very hard thing to deploy and, and actually measure this beta testing. Beta testing is a huge, you know, enterprise to solve that. Uh, it may be impossible. You're going to Mars. You can't do it twice. Brain surgery. You don't want to do it twice. You don't want to screw it up once and try again. Landing gear, you know, the thing that puts the wheels down. So, at least in development, you need, you need a different method. And it has to be, in some sense, if not completely inferior to the model, at least in the same. <laughs> building, same machine, same task. And so it's not really uh, intrinsic doesn't mean inside the model exactly, because what we're going to do is we're going to take our data and we're going to do something called a holdout. And you may have heard of this because you've done this in a machine learning <laughs> class. Um, we're going to take our data set, say the brown corpus, and it's going to have uh, uh, a lot of sentences. And you're going to permute them because the for this for for the task we're talking about, I should have clarified that our task is to generate good sentences or to be able to analyze sentences well in terms of their likelihood. It should assign a high probability with, to sentences which are naturally part of the language and users would recognize as good. It should assign a low probability to ones which are weird, maybe even zero or very close to. So what we're going to do is take this, take this set of sentences, that's our data set, say the brown corpus sentences, sentence, and randomly permute them. Because they're all different genre, they're from different places in the paragraph, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Randomly permute them. That's like randomly selecting voters to ask who they voted for. You need a random sample. Yep, we randomize. Then we separate into a training, here's our original data, we separate it into a training set and a holdout set for testing. Now training in this setting is not, I mean training with a neural network, you know you run it and it sets the parameters. Here training means just collecting the statistical information. They want to do a few other things we'll talk about in a moment. <coughs> Training is a funny word in this thing. We build our model based on 80, say 80 percent. That's a sort of typical split. Uh, typically, testing would be 20 to 5 percent somewhere in there. And we hold out 20 percent. And we create your model from the training set. We do not refer to the holdout set. So it's intrinsic, but not inside the model. The model has to be separated from it by a wall. And information does not go back and forth between the two. You don't want to corrupt your, your uh, training with uh, testing data. We'll talk much more about this when we get to deep learning. So we create the model. We create the n-gram distributions. If it's later to train the network, whatever you do. And now, as this is the best we can do. This is a different sample from the infinite language. And we're hoping that it represents, both of these represent that infinite language in some 
useful way. You can see that the bigger your set, the more training you have, the more testing you have. Right? So we evaluate how likely the testing set is using the model. The sentences in the testing set should look very likely because you train them on very similar sentences. And so whatever the sentences look like in the training set, these should look similar. They should be likely. The model should assign them a high probability. How high? Now we have to get into the numbers. Okay? A very common metric, it's not the only one, as I've said, for things like a machine translation, there are different metrics. Kind of a combination of interior and exterior. Perplexity, which is the first slide, which me, the weird haircut looking confused. Um, uh, a language model can evaluate the goodness of sentences by assigning them a probability. And then we saw also it can uh, generate plausible sentences as a way of leveraging this idea of you know, the probability of sequences, we can leverage it to generate sentences. But remember, you can do both, right? But the primary idea of a language, probabilistic language model is to assign a probability to strings of sentences, to, uh, of words. And a, a side benefit, not the main purpose, but a, a, a really nice feature of this, it can be easily turned into something that can generate sentences. But for right now, we're really thinking about just evaluating how well it does at assigning probabilities to sentences. Forget about this one, or forget about generate. So a language model should give a higher probability to well-written text and be perplexed by badly written text, as I am often perplexed when I read student work. The perplexity of badly written text is large, and of a well-written text is small. So you want low perplexity. You do not want to be perplexed. You do not want to be the guy in the... Right? It's an inverse of the probability. The perplexity metric in natural language is right out of this article is a way to capture the degree of uncertainty a model has in predicting, that is, assigning probabilities to text. This is really the same thing. So, suppose our language has, uh, and now I'm not going to, um, for the next couple of slides, I'm particularly talking about diagrams. Suppose the language has a, the, red, fox, dog, and, and a period. We want our, period out, we want our language model to predict the probability of a red fox. That is, we want to predict that A can start, then given that I've seen A, what's the probability the next one is red? Then I've seen a red, what's the probability of fox? Then a red fox, what's the probability of the period? This is sort of the general idea without, you know, infinite content, not, not the bigram. Um, a red fox. So suppose these probabilities are assigned, for whatever reason, these probabilities are assigned to the first word. Point four. Okay, now we've got our first one. And then for successive sequences, Right? It's not necessarily a bigram model or trigram, or whatever. Uh, the first one is 0.4. Then, if you've seen an A, the probability of uh, red is 0.27. And then, if you've seen a red, the probability of fox is 0.55. And if you've seen a red fox, the probability of the period is 0.79. And somehow this was figured out. You multiply them all. Why do you multiply? Remember from probability theory that you know you, um, you these are not exactly in, I wouldn't say independent, but they act as if they're independent. They're not dependent upon anything outside the conditional probability. You multiply them, you get 0.0469. 
text is empty. <coughs> well, I don't. Is it that if you sample all the sentences, you'll come up with this sentence point, you know, about 5% of the time? It's a little confusing. Um, there's another more serious problem. It has to do with multiplying probabilities. The product of probabilities, all the probabilities are between 0 and 1. In other words, they're less than 1, and sometimes they're relatively small. And so as the sentence gets longer, what happens? The probability gets shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter, right? You keep multiplying by numbers that are less than 1, you keep making the total probability smaller. So a red fox is more probable than a red fox and a dog. Both of these seem pretty good. You know, I mean, intuitively, if you whatever your user case, use case is. I mean, why would one of those be much more likely? You understand what's going to happen. The and a uh, dog are each going to be probabilities less than one, and you're going to keep making it smaller. So that means there's a heavy dependence between the length of the sentence and its probability. They have to get less and less, at least certain, you know, as you expand the sentence, it gets less and less and less. But that's not what we figured out. This is not what I had to do this for. This is the probability distribution of sentence length percentages in the brown corpus. I forget, a 20 point something or other was the average length. And, you know, look at this. It gets more, the mode is somewhere around 10 or 11. Now, it's true that as they get really, 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 really long, they get less and less and less. It's what's called a heavy tail. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But that's a product of nat cognitive function. It's a prop, you know, the human languages have evolved such that length, the length is a certain size. Whales communicate with little sentences that are three words long. Okay, I don't, nobody knows exactly how they work. So, bird songs <laughs> could be shorter or longer. You know, communication is based on something cognitive, and so this is not the most important thing happening here is not, you know, that the frequency is, the probability is inversely proportional to its length. Uh, it's not true. So we don't want this to happen. So we want to do something like take the average. We can't take the average of a product. It doesn't work. It doesn't do the right thing. What do we do when we take an average? We add up the bunch of numbers. <coughs> and divide by the number of numbers. Right? Add up 10 digits, divide by 10, you have the average of the digits. But here we have multiplied. And it doesn't work out. It doesn't work out mathematically. It doesn't make sense once you start to do it. But analogously to taking the mean of numbers that are added by dividing, <coughs> What we're going to do is somehow getting the average contribution of each one of them. When we multiply n numbers, a way of getting kind of the average contribution of each one of these is to take the nth root. So you multiply n numbers, and you take the power 1 over n, or the nth root. So if you multiply two numbers, multiply them, two probabilities, and take the square root. And so cube root of three numbers, and so forth. This is called the geometric mean. The geometric mean. It's analogous to the arithmetic mean, which is for adding them. Okay. So, it actually turns out that if you do this in log space, you can use a normal arithmetic mean if you take the log. Let me take a slight digression here. This was a slide on a previous lecture. Digression. Uh, how do we do calculations in machine learning? It's not universally, I'm just saying in the main, when we're doing something where we're calculating with probabilities, we want to know two things. We want to be able to multiply, 
and we want to be able to see if one is bigger than the other. Compare one bigger than the other. We want to check for greater than, we want to be able to multiply. Well, if we take the log of the probabilities, in other words, instead of adding and checking for greater than over here, we cross over to the other wall, and now we're in log space. You've taken the log of everything. We take the log, here we are in normal space, you have an exponential curve, and over in log space, it's a straight line. Right? And you get the idea. Well, if you look at the log, log has some characteristics. You, it, its domain only includes numbers greater than zero. At zero would be infinite infinity. Um, so it has to be greater than zero, but look, it's monotonic, which means it's constantly increasing. So you can use it for greater than. Uh, P is less than Q if and only if log of P is less than, in other words, if, if P is here and Q is here, well, I guess you would just, then the log is also going to be greater than. It preserves comparison. Why do the log? Two reasons. One is you can store more information in a log in the sense that you don't have overflow. When you get really, 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 really small numbers, they can run off the end, and you can lose significant digits. When you have log, it kind of shifts them back. And you gain not you gain some, some additional precision. Okay? Another reason is that, if you remember your 210 stuff, there's a separate processor for multiplication. Addition is incredibly fast. One machine cycle. A nanosecond. <laughs> Two's complement, bang, you know, all in parallel, you get, you can add or subtract numbers incredibly fast. Multiplication, it has to go over to the multiplication unit, you know, and it's a cyclical thing, and then essentially it can be done in a lot of time, but still, there's more overhead there. And if this is an incredibly frequent thing to do, you'd rather add than multiply. So, if you want to multiply two probabilities, you take the log of the, of the product, you remember what happens, you bump everything to uh, a lower, a simpler operation, so the log of a product is the sum of the logs, you add them up very fast, preserve, when you do this, you preserve more accuracy, and you can use it for comparison directly, if you ever want to get it back to this, you take it to the Exponent means e to the x, or whatever the base of the log is. It doesn't really matter. Okay, you do an exponent. Now that might be expensive, and why do it? <laughs> because really, in most cases, we're only interested in comparing less than. Okay. Anyway, end of digression. So, suppose we have a. A, a sentence W, capital W, W1 through WN. What I want to get to is the perplexity. PP is perplexity. And we're going to get there through first taking the geometric mean. So um, when you find the probability of this sentence, you do it according to the method you're using in your model. Okay, get to that in a minute, but whatever metric you, whatever way you use to estimating the probability, you use that, and then you just take the nth root. You take the one over n power, right? So you take the nth root, and that is the geometric mean of your probability on those n sentences and you're identifying, in some sense, the contribution, average contribution of each one of those probabilities. So, the P norm of a red fox, you get this, you take the fourth power, you know, it basically takes it in order of magnitude bigger. Why? Because you're trying to isolate the contribution of A, red, fox, period, and to separate out, in some sense, the mean of 
each one of those words and how it contributed to the probability of the whole sentence. So a well-written sentence will have a large p norm. Okay, a poorly written sense will have a small p norm. Okay, it'll always be between zero and one. But we want perplexity, and perplexity is large for bad sentences. I'm really perplexed, or very low. Okay, for good sentences. So we just take the inverse. <laughs> we just take one over the p norm. Okay, so that's how we get our formula. It's one over the probability, take the nth root. Or, this is the way it's usually, however you calculated the probability for your sentence, normalize it by taking it to the power, the negative of one over n, the nth root, but it's the inverse. So that's the, that's the formula. Remember, low perplexity good, high perplexity bad. What is it in Orwell's um, Animal Farm? Two legs bad. Two legs bad, four legs good. That's what they chant. Um, so let's have an example. Suppose a sentence of length n, the, the, the alphabet, the characters are just zero and one. They're bits. Okay? And if you think of, if I reveal these, you know, from left to right, you see a one. What was the probability you were going to see a 1? 50%. You could say, before I showed you the first character, I'm just going to give you the intuition and show that it's supported by the formula. If I say to you, OK, I'm going to reveal these characters to you one at a time and ask you how perplexed you are. Well, for the first one, it's 50%. And there's two alternatives. So your perplexity is 2. Gosh, I don't know which of 2. All right, so you measure with 2. Now, you've seen a 1. Maybe a 0. But there's no relationship between them. Right? Now you're still perplexed. 2. I give you. Every time I generate a digit, you say 2, because I don't know which one it's going to be. Because they're equally likely. Well, that's supported by this formula, right? The probability of the 1 that begins is 0.5. The probability of the 0 is 0.5. I'm just telling you this is the model. It's not a bigram. It's not any of this. The probability of each one of these is 0.5. So the probability of each one of these is 0.5 times 0.5. It's going to be 1 half to the 6th power. I guess 1 over uh, 64. Well, then I take it. That's just going to be 0.5 to the n, however long the sentence is. And then I take it to the 1 over n power. And it's just the inverse of this, and that's 2. So there's the intuition. You're, per, you're confused. It's going to be one of two. Now, when you change the rules a bit, it's not so automatically obvious. Maybe somebody can provide a better explanation on it. Suppose the probability of one is 0.75, and the probability of zero is 0.25. And you see this sentence. One, zero, one, one, one. The first thing you'd say is, like it's good because ones are more common than zeros. Not exactly three to one, but you know, seems like it should be pretty well. Well, let's figure it out. It should be less surprising from the previous model. Because if I were asking this gentleman ones or zeros, and ones were more, more probable than zeros, he'd be, you'd be surprised if one, when a zero shows up slightly, and slightly less surprised <coughs> when a one shows up. Again, there's no bigrams or anything. It's just one at a time. So what would you get? Probability of 1 is 0.75. And blah, blah, blah. Keep doing that. Taking the fifth root and inverted, you get 1.66. The probability of any sequence of bits when the probability is equal is 2. But now the probability is higher because there's more ones, and so the perplexity is lower. Remember, two legs bad, four legs good. No. High perplexity is bad, low perplexity is good. The inverse. You don't want to be perplexed, especially in this class. So it's better. 
Well, the, what range are the perplexities going to be? If, um, if I see a sequence of ones, sorry, if I see a street sequence of ones, then we're back where we were when we had point, you know, 0.75 to the n power 1 over n. You get the inverse of 0.75. So 1 and a third is the best you can get. Uh, the perplexity of a string of zero, because that's the most likely thing, right, to see a 1. Not going to happen randomly, but that would be the best thing. A, a string of zeros would be the least likely, and the perplexity of that is 4. So if it's the inverse of the probability, how many choices are you confused about? It's a little hard to see the numbers here, how they work out. Okay, so let's figure out from this Markov model, what's the perplexity of John? Well, let's figure it out. The probability of John. Now, 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 let me make this point. Now we're in the bigram model. Now I have to use the same method to calculate the probability of a sentence that I use to generate. Or analyze, or whatever. This, this can be used for generation, or it can be used for some other purpose. But the point is it's a model of what happens as you go through the language word by word. So the probability of getting John is two-thirds. The probability of getting the end of sentence marker is one-third. When you multiply them, you get two-ninths. You take the square root, and you get 1.074. That's pretty low probability or uh, perplexity. Mary likes to watch movies. Now, um, did, did Mary watch movies? Well, sort of. We sort of referred to it glancingly. Um, wasn't in the corpus, but we can estimate from the corpus how likely or how perplexing that is. It turns out not very, uh, but Mary likes to watch movies end of sentence. Take the fifth root, you get 1.182. So again, not very perplexing that Mary likes to watch movies, given our data. But this sometimes does surprising things. And it's not a perfect metric, and it doesn't always correspond to our intuition. And I would say that mostly, give me one sec, mostly this has to do with length. Long sentences can have very low perplexities. If you figure out, John likes to play cards more, John likes to play cards more than John likes to play cards too, but Mary likes to play cards more than John likes to watch movies. Somebody's calling me. They don't like this sentence. <laughs> it's, the, it's the sentence police calling me. Um, that doesn't seem like a very likely sentence. Maybe this is an answer to your point, too. If you look at it in a little, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is good. 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 Oh, my God. What am I creating? Right? It's too long. It doesn't make sense. But perplexity. Because you continue to take the roots, you get a very low perplexity. And that's a little disturbing or funny. So this is something I've thought about a lot. And we're going to try to, we're going to think about it, maybe not in this homework. But maybe you need some part of this that has to do with sentence length. But we'll leave it where it is. OK. And here are the, here are the, how do you now evaluate? Um, you have your test set. It's a set of sentences. Uh, these are all independent. So if we figure out probabilities, we're going to have to multiply them all. So it's almost as if you just create a huge long sentence out of the test set and evaluate its perplexity. Um, and uh, 
But you have to use the same rule that you used in the language. So the chain rule, as somebody pointed out to me at the end of last class, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But we're going to have like bigrams, trigrams. And you're, you're going to use the same method that you use to figure out the probability. If you want, you know, and then you take the nth root. Yes? Yeah, I know. You've got a repetition problem. You've got a repetition problem. You got a repetition problem. <laughs> uh, you can do ad hoc things, but yeah, yeah. There's more natural ways to do this. Yeah, yeah. Repetition is a problem. <laughs> so, but but here's the thing. Here's the conclusion. To test a model. Uh, you train it on the training set, you test it on the testing set. The quality of the model is the complexity of the entire test set essentially considered as one long string. If you just concatenated them all together, you'd have a start of symbol, then an end of sentence symbol, followed by another one, and that's pretty likely. And then you, you could just concatenate the whole thing. Or multiply them, get the probability to multiply them, and then or nth root of all the words. Various ways to do it. So, for example, the Wall Street Journal is a big corpus, 38 million words, uh, 1.5 million in the, uh, in, the, in the test set. Uh, when they get a unigram model, terrible. <laughs> it just picks likely words. Right? Uh, perplexity was very large. Bigram, smaller. Trigram, even smaller. Now, what happens is you go more and more and more. Now, quadrograms, pentagrams, hexagrams, heptagrams, octagrams, nonagrams, decagrams. Um, what happens? Well, the perplexity gets less and less and less, but maybe just because you're memorizing. And this isn't going to really be a problem for us, we're, but we're going to try this. Okay. Here's now, we're finally come to this young lady's question. I'm going to run out of time. We'll pick it up next time. Um, what do you do if separated it in? Here, it's not much of an issue, but, you know, she suggested that what if you get a combination you've never seen before? Like, you get a sentence like, Mary likes to watch movies with John. Now, why would that show up? Well, maybe you trained it on a training set. We're coming back to your question. And now, in the holdout set, you have a word that didn't occur in the training set. Uh, that word has probability zero because you didn't train on it. Right? Now, when, the reason I kind of deferred on your question was when you're generating models, you don't have this problem. Right? Then, in a generative model, you generally you don't have to have the problem. You're only going to follow the rules. But what happens when you split it, and there's a word in your training set, and it's no fair saying, whoa, 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 we can't use those. That's like the professor giving you a test and talking about something, and just asking you a question on something they haven't talked about. Yes, that's unfair. Well, no, you can't design your testing set to satisfy your needs, right? You have to have the argument. So, serious problem. How about Mary likes to watch cards? Has all the right words, but watch cards is not a bigram. Right? The probability is, the, is zero, so the perplexity is infinite. You'd be very infinitely complexly perplexed. So, here's generating Shakespeare. You train on Shakespeare with one grams, two grams, three grams. This shall forbid it should be branded if renowned made it empty. Looks kind of good, right? but doesn't mean much. Hey, Henry, what? I will go seek the traitor Gloucester. Okay. Um, now, this is a generative model, but, you know, the problem is, if you really want to build a model for Shakespeare, um, there's relatively few words, about 30,000 words. Uh, and if you just square that, now what am I talking about? Every possible way of having a bigram 
where you take one word from the corpus and put it next to another word in the corpus. It's going to use the same word. Henry, Henry. Any two words. There's going to be a huge number, 844 million. So of the possible vibrams, 99.96 are not in are not in Shakespeare. <laughs> so you can see there's a problem. If you're generating languages, you can control this, but not if you're separating into a training set, or not if you're building a model and want to launch it into the wilds of you know America, whatever, your iPhone, and have it do interesting things where people say strange things, right? especially to their iPhones. So <laughs> that's a real problem. Um, so again, we're gonna oops, we're gonna run out, out of time, but let me get as far as I can. We'll pick it up next time. Uh, the basic idea is actually pretty simple, um, and it's why we're using the um, default dictionary. Remember what the default dictionary does? You're building a bag of words for a text, and what you're going to do is have the vocabulary. And you're going to count how many occurrences of each word occur in some piece of text. And you're going to have numbers, counts, frequencies, and then almost everything else is zero. If you divide by the total number of words, right, then you get percentages or probabilities. Okay? But still, the zeros don't go away. And I want to keep emphasizing there can be things which occur, if this is your training set and this is your testing set, there can be, there can be words here that didn't occur here and you can't fudge. <laughs> so it's a problem. And it's a problem in real life that, like, you know, words change and ChatGPT has to deal with words it's never seen before. So we'll generalize the zeros. And this is pretty straightforward, right? The training set says deny the allegations, deny the reports, deny the claims, deny the request. And the test set, it says deny the offer, deny the loan. These are reasonable sentences from the infinite language. They just didn't end up in your training set because you took a random sample. In other words, they can't be zero. They're not zero in the infinite language. They're only zero in the training set. So you do something that's, you can't, you can't compute the perplexity because when you get to that word, it's zero. Right? Like I showed you before, the complexity is infinite. You're, you're screwed. That's difficult. And it shouldn't be infinite. The probability shouldn't be zero. It's only zero because you took a sample. So we do something very, very simple. There's a, bu there's a bunch of ways to do this. The simplest way is called the Laplace moving because Mr. Laplace hundreds of years ago figured something out. Instead of having, you know, denied the whatever, three allegations, two reports, one claims, one request, and here are the probabilities of the, of the trigram denied the, one of these words, okay? And here are the probabilities, but for attack, man, outcome, and all kinds of other words, the probabilities are zero. Now, what you want to do is smooth this so it doesn't have a zero. So you do something really simple. You add one to every count. Now they're not zero. But now you have, you have to adjust it. You, 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 know, you want to divide by uh, a different num d denominator because you've added one to every count. So you have to add the size of the vocabulary to the denominator. So you just pretend that you always have one more than you actually saw. Very simple idea. It doesn't work great for n-grams, but instead of calculating the probability that this, you know, divided into the probability that it was followed by i for bigrams, add one to this always for every single one and there's the size of your vocabulary. Well, whatever the, the number of bigrams. You just, just bump the whole thing up a little bit and recalculate so that they're 
the probabilities again. So, uh, add one isn't optimal for n grams, and I'm going to stop here and we'll look at some other ideas. But it works pretty well in text classification, and it works very well where there aren't a lot of zeros. If it's an unknown word, it only occurs in one or two places. That works well. And it, it gets, you're not fudging it by that much. Right? Anyway, we'll stop here. Uh, off showers today, tomorrow, assignment is due Thursday, remember? Uh, but I'm going to post your big assignment. Did I tell you how hard it was going to be? Did I say that? Yes. Okay. You'll have it Wednesday night. to something else so that you can remove all the other colons, that's fine too. And then change it back or remember that. Right. Change to an underscore. Got it. Make sure underscore is not in there. Change it to an underscore. Then later on, when you fill the model, just look for the underscore. It's all good. There's lots of ways to do this. And for uh, the stop words when you're moving and you're fixing the space so that we have the word boundary. Again, so just, just in case, it. you know, you don't want to... You, if you're deleting something that's in the middle of a word, um, like a, a when you when you're deleting apostrophe t or something, you can just delete it. But it's always safer if you're somewhere in between words to replace it with a blank, because you're going to split at the end on blanks anyway. Right. So it doesn't matter if you hit all these. Like, I mean, yeah, that's fine. It's fine, right? Like, I don't. I don't doesn't have to matter press it into one space. Okay, got it. You want him to look better, replace. It. Blank plus with blank. But then I don't have to. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, so like, with, you know, with, see, like all of these stuff, like, because we are removing stuff, so this um, blank, I mean, I can leave it. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes blanks show up in weird places because of yeah. things, and you can always filter them out. Okay. Are they boring because they're too common? Or are they? Like, I mean, you know, like it's, it's kind of weird because it doesn't take very good account of length. It, it assigns high probability to absurdly short word sentences and low probability to absurdly long uh, low probability to absurdly long. It's not very good for point. I'm just trying to make that point. What I mean is, like, it looks like it looked like the proportion was very low. It was, it was, it was, it was a sentence that the word for word existed. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. yeah. And, and second thing but maybe I chose it. But you can see that if it's memorized the training set, it's going to have very low complexity for the words in the training. Set. Right. So that's why it's like maybe it's like overfitting and just, you know maybe too, too low of a per per that. Yeah. It's not a perfect measure. It's just the average of the contributions of the probability. 
It's a very simple idea. But if you really want a really good metric, you're going to have to have something more complicated than that, including length. If you've got this big problem of sampling coming in, I mean, it's a really hard problem. So this, is a, this is what people use. It's not maybe the, the best possible metric by it. It's where we start. And the second thing is, like, like, it, it's just no, a number, and it's all numbers are relative. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. something like fifty mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. means mm -hmm. all. Well, in a way, I was trying to give the intuition that as you see bits show up, you're perplexed too because you have two possibilities. It's kind of like the branching facts. Like how many choices? And when you start talking about sentences, it's a little harder to see. But if I'm going to tell you a digit, and I'm choosing at random. Your complexity is not a Because there's 10 possibilities and you don't know which one. It's the inverse of the probability. Okay, I'm about to tell you a Five. Now, that was one tenth of the possible number. So you didn't know which one I was going to do. If you were betting on it, you wouldn't know which number I was going to say. And the probability of pick a five would be one tenth. But we want the inverse of that. So your perplexity is how many choices you have to choose from. How surprised. If I say something and the perplexity is a thousand, I was about to say any one of a thousand things. And you didn't, you're very confused when I said that. If I say something very expected, there's not many choices. So it's something about the branching faster, how many choices you're expecting. To I, I, that's about the best intuition. So, so for bigger data sets, you would expect the complexity to be higher? You get a better estimate of the complexity of larger data. A better model. You know, but the more that the test set looks like the training set, the lower the complexity is going to be. You won't say surprising weird things. The patterns will be the same. And so the perplexity will be low. It will never be zero if you have one sentence. <laughs> but uh, that's about the best I can do. Two second questions. You know, I wrote I wrote an assignment for the first assignment. I wrote I wrote an assignment having Wordle. Yeah. And I'll show you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Look, look at the email. I'll send you my copy. Because it's very interesting. You have five letter words. Yeah. And then there's a certain probability for Absolutely, I'm taking this class on information theory this semester because I played Wordle. I have like a 500 day streak. I feel like it's a very like yeah. natural. Yeah, maybe I should add a fact. Yeah, because I have, I literally, literally, I sat there for two or three hours and I've written a Wordle program right now. Start to play Wordle on the first part. Yeah. And uh, you know, what's the most likely guess? Yeah. I just think it's a small. I know, it's, a time, anyway. it's a small data set of puzzle problems. It's, it's, it's not even all five hundred words. Are they restricted to some like smaller data set? They don't give you the data. They do. They do. Okay. 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 I, I had that, and I was literally going to do it for the first time, and then I I'm interested in it, but... I think it was too complicated. Yeah. 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 Extra credit for the final part. Yeah, there we go. Yes, you did. Oh, thank God. Oh, thank you. There you go. I put the right here. Let me, let me clear out and let's talk out there. Let's go outside and all.